right now a seat this morning. The scripture says in John that the next day, the crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and he sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified, they realized that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Jesus has been with, will be with us a little while longer. This morning, Janice McDowell will come and light our Christ candle. I enjoy going to movies, and I don't know if you enjoy them as well. One of the things about that is I don't go as often as I'd really like to. So I do like most people. I go ahead and get the DVD or rent it occasionally so I can enjoy the movies that I don't want to miss. But basically, I've narrowed down my movie watching to a certain, to a certain uh, way of watching movies. Uh, the first rule is I don't pay $8 to watch a cartoon. The cartoons were free on Saturday morning when I was growing up, and I just don't see the, the point in paying $8 to go watch one in a movie theater. I'll wait until it hits network television and watch it as often as I want to, and during a marathon at Christmas time. So I don't do that. The other thing is, is that I don't watch a lot of romantic movies. Uh, Sharon does not force me into that. Uh, occasionally, I've surprised her with one or two of those. Sometimes, or a couple of times, we went to a movie and were surprised that it was a romantic novel. Didn't know that. I didn't do my research before we went. I usually like to watch movies that, to me, are funny. I like to go to the movies and laugh. It's a, it's a way, I guess, for me to escape, and that's fair enough. We all need that occasionally. We all need to laugh. So I'll go to a movie to laugh. I'll go to a movie that I believe is in some way going to inspire me. I like to leave a movie with some kind of emotion, and some kind of feeling or strong feeling about it. And so uh, being able to go to a movie and be inspired by someone's life or some story is really uh, significant for me. I don't like uh, action movies necessarily. Again, I'll kind of wait till they come around uh, to, te to television and watch them there. And then a lot of times I'll watch uh, movies that have our stories that are repeated. Most recently, I've been into uh, a series of World War II movies. Uh, there's several of those that have hit the screens lately, and uh, that's mostly because my dad was in World War II, and it's just something that I kind of read and follow along now. I do uh, create a few uh, uh, enemies when I say that I don't know that, uh, that reading a book is better than watching a movie. I figure if reading a book really was better, then there wouldn't be movies. And so I'll just wait for the movie to come out. Movies are important. I, I really do enjoy movies. But here's what I've noticed about movies is that you, you react to a, a movie differently when you know the ending or when you can anticipate the ending. So for, in a lot of ways, for me, for me to get my money's worth out of a movie, I want to be surprised a bit. I want to be surprised in some way, because I feel like that if I've gone there and just watched something and become too comfortable, then I've really not taken good advantage of my time. This week, we're going to be sharing a narrative. And it's a narrative that in the church that we've become very, very familiar with. In fact, possibly so familiar with that narrative that we enter into this story, into this, this holy week that we experience together, and there's nothing about our life that really tries to align with what the story is telling us. It's too predictable. We already know the ending. We've already responded to God at some time in our life, and so we have little anticipation about what the script of this narrative can really mean for our life. My hope and my prayer every year when we enter into this time is that we would be able to go through this narrative and hear what God has to say to us that is new. I believe that there's something new for us because life for you is different this year than it was a year ago. There's been things that we've experienced in our own life that draw us to God in a different kind of way. And so the message of this narrative is important to us. And we need to hear that narrative. We don't want to just anticipate the ending. 
In fact, what we really want to do is to allow ourselves to live in the tension of the experience of Jesus. That's why we refer to it as Holy Week, when we examine day by day the experiences of Jesus. We participate in activities that will kind of jar us in ways that we might be able to see the narrative differently. This morning I want to read for us in Mark chapter 15, the text that's there in the first 15 verses. Very early in the morning, the chief priest with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You've said so, Jesus replied. The chief priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, are you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. There was a man named Barabbas who was in prison with the insurrectionist who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what, they, what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing was that, it, that it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What then shall I do then with the one that you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. And then they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. The narrative of the Passion Week is a shifting narrative. It's one that doesn't stay constant for us. And so in our life, as we pair our life with what God is doing and what God was doing through the life of Jesus, what we want to do is to bring our life alongside him and to walk with him in however way that he has provided for us. We acknowledge the shifts. We embrace to some degree those shifts that occur throughout this week. And, and in those experiences, hope that because of that experience, we become richer in understanding who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. We began our worship this morning with palms and, and the singing of Hosanna, trying to prepare ourselves for the high of this moment. The people had gathered their things together. It was time to go to Jerusalem. The Jews went to Jerusalem at this time of year for the festival and they gathered their family and they made this trek. It was an annual trek for them. And as they prepared their things, I can assure you that probably their travels might sound, would sound very similar to your travels. Are we there yet? Did we get everything? Is everyone with us? They made their way to Jerusalem. As they were making their way to Jerusalem, probably they were talking about things that you would need to talk about in those moments for an extended period of time. There weren't movies to watch, so they had conversation about current events, about things that were going on, and possibly, maybe the conversation turned towards this person of Jesus. And then something shifted. Jesus was near and his presence was acknowledged. And as they acknowledged his presence, they gathered up the palm leaves and they ushered him in to Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna. It was a high moment in the narrative. I can imagine the amazement on some of those people who walked that way to Jerusalem and upon seeing Jesus, they had not seen him before. They had heard the stories. They knew, they knew some of the things that Jesus had done, but they had never been able to lay eyes on him. Some of them were close to him for the very first time. And then there were those who had walked with Jesus. I wonder what they were thinking. 
As this made this shift and they began to watch what was happening to Jesus, maybe they were glancing at one another, wondering what was really taking place, finding it hard to imagine that they were walking with the one that everyone was acknowledging. In fact, in some ways, they might have been thinking we were closest to him. The narrative moves on past the welcoming palms to a meal. Now, this was a meal that required some preparation. And so Jesus gives us, we find some instructions in Scripture on the, in, that Jesus had given to his disciples. And so they find themselves in this room. Maybe still ecstatic over the experience that they had had of the waving of the palms and the shoutings at Jesus and the excitement of the people. You see, Jerusalem was different this time of year. There was excitement. There was, there was movement. People were moving about with, with their lives and their families. But also, they're recognizing the significance of their faith. They'd come there to meet God. And so they were having their meals, and Jesus had gathered the disciples together to have their meal together. And as they gathered, there was a bit of an undercurrent that occurred in that process. Somewhere along the journey with Jesus, the disciples began to wonder. Now, they had not quite put together the pieces of what was really going to happen to Jesus. They hadn't quite figured out that this, his, his leaving them was going to be a, a catastrophic type of event in their life. And in the process, they began to think about their own positioning. Maybe how significant they were in this relationship to Jesus. And so they come into this room to gather, having prepared the room to enjoy this meal to gather that they had often taken together. And rather than it being a time of them being with Jesus and encountering God and recalling the story of the Passover, they found their minds wandering into this experience of I wonder what my position is with Jesus because he is a big deal. He had his meal with his disciples. In the course of that meal, the narrative shifts to a certain individual. That individual we know because we've seen the story before. We are familiar with the story. In fact, many of us are anticipating what is about to go down at the meal. Jesus calls out the betrayer. Now, in the chaos of the meal, or the ongoing of the meal, not everyone captured exactly what was taking place when Jesus said that that one who would betray him is sitting among them. First of all, it didn't get their attention because they hadn't thought about anyone being a betrayer. They were thinking about who was going to be closest to Jesus. And then Jesus introduces this to their narrative. Now they have to deal with this. Now maybe they're a little bit more attentive to what's going on in the room or to the things that Jesus was going to be saying. The betrayer is called out in that room and Jesus serves him and he, and he leaves. There were some, the scripture says, that weren't even sure why he left. Maybe they thought maybe he had some bills to take care of for the meal, or maybe there were other things, other parts of business as being the treasurer that he had responsibility for. They knew that someone had left the room. That part was acknowledged. He was leaving the room all right. Judas was going to take care of some things. He had his own thoughts, and it's hard to speculate what those thoughts exactly were, but he had his own ideas about maybe what ought to happen next, and so he made some arrangements. And through those arrangements, he became the one who was the betrayer. I don't know that we had anticipated that. Maybe along the way, there were those that weren't crazy about Judas. I mean, he did take care of the money. That's kind of setting yourself up for criticism. We already had one conversation about perfume earlier in the story, in this narrative, where there was question about how much money that perfume would have cost when they anointed Jesus. So the, con the idea of money was a part of their consciousness. Then he's betrayed. He's betrayed with a kiss, and we recall that, and so that evokes some emotion from our life. 
that someone so beloved, someone celebrated in such a short period earlier, would now be the one who would be betrayed by one that we thought loved him in a very affectionate kind of way. At that moment, he was arrested, and the narrative shifts. They begin to start this process of trial. And this is that place in the narrative where if you're really living the experience, you begin to sense that you're losing your grip on what is taking place. Predictability has long left the process. And now you're having to wait. And as you wait, the tension and the anxiety begins to rise in your life as you watch what begins to take place. And as it's happening, you know that it's unbelievable. You never would have imagined this is the, where things would have gotten to. And yet we know it's only the beginning. There's a narrative of fear that begins to grip the life of the people. Maybe they were afraid that they would be called in as witnesses and have to testify that they knew Jesus. Maybe they were afraid that someone, through the process of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, had seen them near him and they began to fear for their own life and their own arrest. Fear began to grip the life of the people, those closest to Jesus and those who had followed along with Jesus as they watched, and as they watched a Roman government do what they do best. Now, there was already a fear for Rome. There was already tension in the political climate of that world. The Jews were a bit of a nuisance to the Roman government and now we're about to see that in full display. They were fearful, and rightfully so. There was chaos as they found themselves in an overcrowded city at a very special time of year. The undercurrent now has come full, full steam ahead and surfaced, and now we see what's really beginning to unfold, and we can't control a thing. It is entirely out of control. We don't know what to do. In fact, as we watch it begin to unfold, we try to distance ourselves so we were not associated with it, and we watch it in disbelief. Occasionally, chaos grips us and grips us so tightly that there's denial in our life. There's denial that we even know God. There's denial that we were even a part of the process. We try to create this distance from God in our life and in ourself because the chaos is too much for us to understand. It's easier just to deny that it even exists. Sometimes we think that in our denial that it will self-correct. That maybe if I lie down and I take a nap and I wake up, then everything else will be set right and everything will be okay. But this was not the narrative. followers begin to scatter. And we can see how this begins to happen when the intensity of following Jesus is increasing. It's easiest for us to find ourselves wandering off. Only in this case, I don't think they were just wandering. I think they were intentionally beginning to scatter. Even those that had followed Jesus for some time began to distance themselves from him and from what was about to go on. They needed to create that distance. They needed to scatter. And maybe some scattered and, and found themselves on the edges where they could watch and observe and feel as if they were still participating in the narrative of God through Jesus. But most were just gone. And then we get to that place of an unscripted ending. An unscripted ending is that kind of narrative that plays out in your life where when the narrative is over, you still have anxiety about what took place. It's like falling asleep and sleeping so soundly that you begin to dream. And you have that dream that kind of makes you uncomfortable Maybe you went to bed hungry. Maybe you went to, to bed after a long day's work and, and there were some cramps in your body. 
but you were dreaming and you found yourself dreaming. And as you moved into this dream, it got towards, it gets towards the, the, day, the time that you're about to wake up. And when you wake up, you're still, un, there's that unresolved dream in your life, that unresolved experience. And so you find yourself kind of moving through the part of the early day, just kind of out of sorts. Unscripted endings work that way in our life. And sometimes we've had to just live our way and force our way through some unscripted endings. This experience of Jesus was not one that they anticipated. They didn't pick up on the teachings of Jesus. It didn't quite make sense, some of the things that he was meaning when he was teaching them and spending time with them, even though he had tried to prepare them for what was ahead. But even if they had grasped it, they wouldn't have imagined it ending this way. It just couldn't. Jesus was too good. Jesus cared for people. Jesus, when everyone else wanted to push people away, wanted them to be brought near. So for people, cruel people, religious people, to take this kind of person and to subject him to the the chaos of this experience was simply wrong. This unscripted ending was Jesus crucified. Wow. We can do many things to put ourselves in that place where we join in on that experience. But the reality is, for us, it's just a narrative. But for the people of Jesus, it was very real. And we think about the cross. We try to put ourselves at that place and maybe even lift our head where we can imaginatively see Jesus on the cross. But it's still a narrative. It's still something that we will awake from and hope that there's something about our spirit that is richer because of the experience. But we can't be there. That's not enough. It's not enough that the religious uh, factor, the high priest, subjected Jesus to this and falsely accused him and put him on a Roman cross which is there, that was the worst demonstration of, of cruelty that, they, that you could imagine, and that was what they had prepared for others, for other criminals, and now they had prepared for Jesus. But then there's that moment in this unscripted narrative where you learn and you hear and you experience that Jesus is dead. Maybe you've had that news before in your life where the phone rings and you pick up the phone and you learn that someone near you is dead. And you recall the emotions of that, the experience of just finding it hard to believe that it's even true. But the narrative of Jesus reads at this moment and that spreads throughout the the people that Jesus no longer lives, that Jesus has died. This narrative that I've invited you into this morning is not intended to be a narrative that is not hopeful. But it is a narrative that we have to live. We have to experience the tension, not just of this day or of these readings, but of this week. And in that, we look for our own hopeful narrative. Sometimes our narrative is scripted in the familiar. That life for us becomes so familiar and so routine that we miss these unscripted endings. We already know the ending. So why put ourselves through the tension of this experience? Why go into a holy week really seeking for God to do something new when I can accept the old and the, and the, and the ending narrative that I'm familiar with? But we want it to mean more. We hope that it can be more. 
I want to invite you in, in, to enter into the story this week. And entering into the story, don't script the ending. React to the chaos of injustice and live in the tension of your hope being erased. Don't retreat. Put one foot in front of the other and allow yourself to linger. Acknowledge the insanity of this process, but don't let yourself run away to more pleasant things. God is not finished. Let God tell the story in His way. Stop assuming, or you may wish to miss the story that God's trying to tell. The strange story of the ending of Jesus' life is not old. It's new. And it ought to be new in the heart of every person who believes in God. May God help you to live in the tension of this unscripted narrative this week. Let me lead us in prayer.